Hi folks, my name is Cole, and I'm a graduate student of immunology. Today on Investigate, Explore, Discover, we're going to be looking at a novel HIV therapeutic that attacks the viral envelope. So stick with me throughout this whole video to get all of the relevant background information, so that way we can dive into some exciting experimental results. Plus, if you look in the description below, there is a link on how you can get your hands on a free NFT. But to the topic at hand, HIV. Worldwide, there are about 38 million people living with HIV, with the majority of them concentrated in Southern Africa. We've known about HIV for decades. And if you look at some of the stats from the previous decade, we are actually doing much better in our ability to treat it. Yes, there are more people infected with HIV, but there are less people becoming infected and dying from this disease, which is really a testament to how far we've come in being able to treat it. This has been aided in part by some ambitious targets to end the HIV AIDS epidemic. This goal is called 90-90-90, and it describes 90% of people that have HIV being aware of their status, of them, 90% are on antiretroviral therapies, and of those on treatment, 90% of them are virally suppressed, so they cannot spread HIV to others. As you saw on the map, HIV is not spread evenly throughout the world, and similarly, it does not affect all populations the same. HIV does infect many different populations, but it is of particular concern to the LGBTQ plus community, specifically gay men who make up one of the largest groups of new diagnoses of HIV. When being infected with HIV, there are distinct disease progression steps. The first stage of the disease is the acute infection, which lasts about two to four weeks and is described as one of the worst flus that people have ever experienced. This then shifts into what we call clinical latency, which is an asymptomatic form of infection. Now this can last for many years, but if not treated appropriately with antiretroviral therapy, this progresses into something called AIDS, Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, which is characterized by your CD4 T cells being below 200 cells per millimeter cubed, which means that you are effectively unable to fight off new infections and you are much more susceptible to common infections that would not pose a risk to healthy individuals. And because of this, those infected with AIDS have a lifespan of about three years. The human immunodeficiency virus is a retrovirus, which means that at its core is RNA. The virus itself has many different proteins, which it utilizes to mediate pathogenesis, of which each of them are important for a different stage in the HIV infection life cycle. There are many steps to this life cycle, but for the virus to be able to infect new cells, it needs to create new infectious agents called virion. Nowadays though, thanks to advances in modern medicine, HIV infection is no longer a death sentence. And this is due in part to the creation of antiretroviral therapies, which are drugs that need to be taken daily to maintain efficacy and block different parts of the HIV replication life cycle. These drugs by themselves are not foolproof and do have their own sets of issues. One of the major issues with these drugs is how much they cost. It is estimated that someone infected with HIV will spend approximately $600,000 across their lifetime managing this disease. Collectively in the US in 2018, $22.5 billion have been spent on HIV treatments. That is so much money. To put that into perspective, by some estimates, this is more than the combined yearly GDP of Zimbabwe. Another issue with antiretroviral therapies is the development of resistance. This is when treatment is started against HIV and viral levels initially drop, but HIV has a high mutation rate. And so mutations would develop that would allow the virus to escape from the drugs that are acting upon it. To the virus's benefit, there are also sites of viral refuge within the body, which are sites that are immune privileged, which are harder for drugs to access and thus exert their mechanism of action. Now, HIV has a high replication rate, and this contributes to these random mutations. And over time, the growth of these treatment resistant populations become dominant and allow the disease to progress into AIDS. So this needs to be consistently monitored. As it stands, there are some current developments to address some of these issues. One of these developments comes in the form of discovery of novel antiretrovirals, 
such as broadly neutralizing antibody. These antibodies can prevent infection by binding cell-free virions, as well as potentially binding to infected cells to mediate antiviral activity. Furthermore, these antibodies can help form immune complexes, which may stimulate the host adaptive immune response, allowing the host to clear out HIV infection. Now these envelope protein of HIV is made up of two kind of distinct subsets, the GP120 region, which is exposed to the outside world, and GP41, which is present inside the viral membrane and kind of anchors this protein. Now there are known HIV antibody binding sites, which target many different parts of this GP120 protein. However, one issue with broadly neutralizing antibodies is that as a therapy, they are crazy expensive to make. The logic can still be carried forward though in targeting the HIV envelope protein. This segues really nicely into the importance of looking into new antiretroviral therapies because HIV is a lifelong infection that needs to be treated as soon as possible. And the high mutation rate of HIV leads to a rapid emergence of drug resistant variants. So we need to broaden our repertoire of antiretroviral therapies to be able to combat this. Thus, identification of previously undefined drug targets and discovery of new antiretroviral therapies is urgently needed. Now, if you also think that these are some important reasons to study HIV therapies, go ahead and give that like button a tap. Now, this brings us to the paper that we're talking about today, which is called An Amphipathic Peptide Targeting the GP41 Cytoplasmic Tail Kills HIV Virions and Infected Cells by Wang et al. from the Fudan University in Shanghai, China. Now, this paper was actually brought to my attention through the comment section in another video, and I really appreciate that. In this study, they identified a peptide that is effective in inhibiting HIV infection. So they screened a peptide library derived from HIV envelope proteins from the HIV reagent program, and they found a peptide that really exhibited anti-HIV activity. And they found that this peptide particularly overlaps uh, the GP41 region of LLP3. This peptide was named F9170, and it forms an alpha helix. Now, the authors of this paper then investigated whether F9170 has broad anti-HIV activity. They took many different strains of HIV and added in F9170 in vitro and found that this peptide inhibits HIV infection and works in a different fashion to known envelope inhibitor drugs, which is important because this gives us another tool in our toolbox to be able to fight HIV. The question was next posed, can F9170 prevent infection? So the authors of this paper established a model where they can infect target cells with HIV virions and set up a parallel experiment where they added F9170 to it and found that F9170 actually inhibits infection in a dose-dependent manner. This then begged the question, where does F9170 actually target? So they looked at the multiple different regions of the envelope protein and looked to see if F9170 would bind there. It did bind to the C-terminal region of GP41. In particular, it bound to residues 828 to 856. This correlates to the LLP1 region. And after testing all of the residues individually, the authors were able to come up with a model for how F9170 interacts with LLP1. Now these peptides are highly conserved amongst HIV and thus why F9170 was effective against multiple different HIV strains. This then leads to the question, well, what exactly is happening when F9170 is interacting with LLP1? And the authors of this paper hypothesized that F9170 may be inducing viral pores by an association between hydrophilic surfaces, which results in a hydrophilic channel. To test this, they looked at what F9170 does to HIV virion, and they found that when adding the two of them together, F9170 disrupts the integrity of these virions. It forms pores in the membrane, effectively thus killing it. So after looking at how F9170 works against free virions, the question arose, well, how does F9170 react to cells that are either expressing viral envelope protein or cells that are infected with HIV? So to do that, they infected cells and expressed these viral envelope proteins on HIV target cells and found that F9170 actually kills cells 
that express the envelope protein and are infected with, with HIV. And it does this via necrosis, which is a form of cell death that leads to the uncontrolled release of inflammatory cellular contents. Now, after identifying what F9170 does to HIV virions, the authors of this paper next looked at some of the physical properties of F9170. And one of the key findings that they identified is that this peptide is stable at room temperature, which is valuable for treatment, because then this treatment does not require additional resources to keep it stable, which make this way more accessible to more people. So knowing all of this, the authors of this paper next asked, how toxic is F9170? And they asked this question because previous studies have identified that LLP1 domains may trigger poor formation in lipid membranes. So what they did is they took F917 and exposed them to HIV target cells without any HIV uh, present. And they found that F917 is not inherently toxic to these cells. So they are able to withstand it. They also looked at F9170 in the context of a mouse model and found that F9170 is not toxic to mice. And they looked at the effects of F9170 in a non-human primate model, specifically in rhesus macaques. And they found that F9170 is not toxic to these monkeys either. So if these proteins are not toxic, what are they doing in the body? To investigate this, they took their mouse model and injected F9170. And they found that this peptide and their control peptide was able to be identified in the kidney, spleen, heart, and lymph nodes of mice. However, F9170 itself was specifically able to be found in the liver, brain, bladder, and uterus. And some of these are immune privileged sites, which means that this peptide would be effective at targeting HIV in hard to reach places. Now to get a better handle on how this drug would affect humans, the authors of this paper used their monkey model and infected these monkeys with simian human immunodeficiency virus and injected these monkeys with their peptide F9170. They found that F9170 was able to inhibit this SHIV infection and that these peptides can be detected up to 11 to 12 hours after injection, which is much longer than other peptides. These peptides also had a half-life of about nine hours. Because this peptide goes to the brain, a major concern is whether it causes brain damage. And in their monkey model, they found that this peptide had no negative effects on the brain. So that was a lot of information to cover, and we're just gonna summarize it quickly here. In this paper, the authors identified a peptide that overlapped with the LLP3 region of the HIV envelope protein. This peptide targeted another membrane-bound region of the envelope protein called LLP1. They found that this protein forms an alpha helix and is able to target cells expressing viral envelope protein and cells infected with HIV to kill them. This peptide kills HIV by forming pores in the virion. The authors of this paper next assessed the cytotoxicity of this peptide and found that it was safe in HIV target cells, mice, and in monkeys. Now, this information, number one, I think is just interesting, but it also is significant because it contributes to the field of HIV therapy. In this paper, the authors discovered an effective peptide that can inhibit HIV replication and disrupt free virions. This peptide has a low cytotoxicity profile across species and high specificity for HIV infected cells, which indicates that it has potential for human trials. F9170 can also reach areas of the body where antibodies cannot. All science is basically a stepping stone for new knowledge. And these steps are driven by questions. I had a few questions of my own when going through this information. The first question I had is, can SHIV be shocked out of hiding and killed with this peptide? So is there the possibility to assess this peptide's effectiveness in being able to clear HIV infections, to cure them? My next question is how quick does resistance arise to this peptide? Because HIV has one of the highest mutation rates of any biological entity that we have collectively ever seen. Another question I had is how can the half-life of F9170 be improved? Because to be used as a treatment, it would require multiple injections per day. I don't know about you, but if I could avoid multiple injections per day, I definitely would. Now, my final question is, what do you think? What sort of ideas or questions popped into your head when hearing about this information? I would love to hear about them in the comment section below. Ultimately, I hope that you learned something. 
More importantly though, I hope that you enjoyed your time doing so. So if you did, give this video a like and subscribe for more in the future. And don't forget to check out the description of this video where you can get your hands on a free NFT. That's it for today though. So I will see you next time.